National Theatre of Scotland and the Royal Society of Edinburgh present 13 Fragments 1. A Naked Back Can you see your name? No? Wait. I will write it in the air for you. Is that how you spell it? There is a time capsule with my name on it. All our names. And inside it, that year, this year, they will bury it for us here and plant a new rose, call it the future, call it Scotland. How lucky I am, how lucky we are. The arched muscular back drifts out of focus. They will bury all these shackled days, tied to, tied down days, homework, homeschool, home, war zone, mask, uniform, front line, phone line, bread line, life line. Wave through the glass, wave hello, wave help, wave it away. Dance alone in your kitchen. Say an iPad goodbye. Goodbye. All those days. Days we realised we knew more about ourselves, but less, much less, about each other. The day they asked us to tell them, tell us, about what it meant to live a life, our life, here, in this place, the our place, our life mattered and the days they asked if we could stop now hadn't they done enough now this is not what they really wanted give us dancing now and songs about summer inside this brand new past they will lay down our voices shh now i'm talking and our flag will be neatly folded is this who we are Patriotic ramblings, tweet, tweet, shudder. Is this where we are? Tweet, tweet, mob, pylon, dog, whistle. The year we clung to our borders and dreamed of escape. Just not for them. Just not for them. Och, you talk, you talk, you talk. Talk, you talk as if we all had the choice to. A naked back. Against a black backdrop, bright light illuminates the bronzed skin and casts a shadow across the hollow of the spine. There is a woman. There is another. There is the other. There are the others. There is this one place. There is this one place. There was that year. That year that never ended. That will carry on after the calendar changes. Two. There was that year. I walked with my friend along an empty beach, sitting two metres apart. She told me her dreams. I told her mine. Together we missed our mothers. Watched the lapwings in the salt marsh, the women swimming in the sea. There was that year. We explained death to our children while sharing our laptops. Watched death happen on the TV, up the road, in a care home, in a hospital bed over a bad connection. We watched death happen. We watched death move like fog. And was all that half-watching? Safe in this place, 
our place, this place, any different from last year and last year and next year and next we watch death happen a man dying calling for his mother a school full of girls a bookshop a home her home a tower full of hope full of dreamers prayer her children a poet falling off a craft inflated with longing drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. Three. A neck. If we were bears, we would have called it hibernation, escaping winter. We are not bears, so we called it other things. And no matter how much we reached out, we were always leaning in, holding back. But I missed standing with you. I did not do that. I'm sorry. But I felt my spine stiffen. Felt my scream form. But what use is the tears of bystanders? And I'm not sure all this will stay buried. No matter how deep a hole they have dug. Four. Legs. That year they called it resilience, or a thousand other things that are to make us feel special, to lay false gold at our feet. I have heard of women like this all my life. Cassandra, the trailblazer, the genius, the philosopher, the compassionate, the brilliant, the weary, the nurse, the doctor, the teacher, the artist, the daughter, the mother. They have always been living this way, giving this way, taking it on. Can we not say it shouldn't have to be so hard? Can we say that now? What use is applause to the exhausted? What use is applause to the overlooked, the underpaid? Can you see your name? No? Wait. I will write it in the air for you. Is that how you spell it? There is a time capsule with all our names in it. They will bury it for us and plant a new rose. They will call it our future. How lucky we are. How lucky. I'm so very. Five. Four arms. And we took what we were given and spun a web for them to catch us in, wore it like a crown, dressed it in like it was gold, like it was silk and not, and not a trap. Tell us. And we didn't go out and protest because our children were restless and our mothers were failing and our work was calling and our bills needed paying. But we took to the night for just a moment to breathe before turning back and walking home. We were just walking. She was just walking home. Six. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not switching on. I'm not turning up. I'm not tuning in. I'm not holding your bloody... Hand, not today, not another day, not another girl, not today, not today. I'm not going to rise up, I'm not going to stand up and fist up and kneel down, not yet, not today, not another day, not another. I'm not taking this on, I'm not fighting your opinions, I'm not coming in today. Today I'm drop weight, I'm pit bound, I'm leveling down, each level down. He took us whilst we slept, whilst we walked, whilst we danced, whilst we worked, whilst we... I'm in the pit, buried neck deep. I'm with the devil today. When you called, pal, I was here. 
nailed to the cross, mate, building a pyre, mate, collecting all the fire, mate, winding rope to the trees. Mother, I'm not going out today. I'm not coming over. I'm hanging with all the wild girls. Other girls, all the other girls. Another girl, another girl. I'm swinging with all the dead girls. I'm swinging with all my dead girls. I'm not getting up. I'm not getting up. I'm pulled in, drawn drapes down, drawn crepe gown, drawn clown face, drawn corpse bride. I'm I'm drowning in pulled sheets, holding off bed lamb, marked. Bell dam, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going, not today. Today I'm down in the mud swamp, sleeping in dark pit, I'm sleeping in bright flash light, I'm drowning in pooled sheets, I'm not, I'm not, not today, not another day, not another, not another girl. A crumpled white bedsheet with creases scored across it. Seven. She stands for another year in a chamber of echoes, prepares to list the dead. They cut to an advert for car insurance, to an old man in a hall of mirrors, before she even finishes saying their names. Eight. In a dream, my grandmother appeared. Gold bangles, red silk, lily of the valley. She handed me rosemary. I took it. I took her hand. My inheritance handed down in larch box. Find your coven, she whispered. Black screen. Nine. If we were real. A statuesque woman with her chest wrapped in white cloth. We would be as tall as statues, as permanent as a street name, as strong as a building named after our sister, built for our sisters to speak. Monuments would rise to meet the birds, our ghost women. Her square-jawed face has neatly cropped black hair and hooped earrings. She casts her cool gaze straight ahead before slowly blinking and turning to the right. Ten. Black screen. I spent a day watching her grilled in the committee room, glued to her, found myself crossing my fingers for her, holding my breath for her, grew angry in my front room for her. All those days, all those women. Wrote a tweet, a post, a letter, phoned a friend, read my diary. I said, she said, he said, he said, he said, took my power and used it. There, I thought, leaving my mark. Enough. And enough I heard back, but it was not an echo of my voice that I heard. It was a movement. Falls to the floor. Eleven. I ditched their expectations for new weight. I watched my arms turn solid and strong, took myself into a cold sea, pushed and lifted myself to somewhere else, somewhere I wanted to be. 12. She lies on her back with only her naked arms and legs visible, stretched upwards as if suspended in space. Cast in shadow, her fingers and toes are pointed up, flexing gently back and forth.
Her smooth calves and forearms drift out of view, leaving only her fingers and toes gently swaying in the darkness before they too vanish from sight. Inch by inch, beginning with her elbows and knees, her limbs begin to disappear from view. We meet as old friends on a bench in the park, drink rum in the cold. She tells us she is done with coping. We get drunk on old stories. When the dark comes, we reach for each other's hands. The Trojan women wait at the edge of their burning city. Cassandra silently mouths the future at the edge of the shore. Her tears fall, silently salting the sea. No one will listen to her. No one will believe her. Not her. Not her. Not yet. I believe her. 13. Her fingers and toes begin to emerge once again. My daughter insisted that I go and watch her climb trees. She climbed up this one tree, went so high, so fast, so sure, I was left looking up. Look up. I was left holding back my fear, willing her on, my arms outstretched. Wait, let me write your name. Plant your grandmother's rosemary. Call it the future. Plant a new rose, call it Scotland, call it, call it the future. If you like, I'll call it hers. I'll call it hers. A National Theatre of Scotland and Royal Society of Edinburgh, RSE, co-production. As part of the RSE's post-COVID-19 Futures Commission. Find out more at rsecovidcommission.org.uk with thanks to RSE Fellows Professor Lynn Abrams, Zinni Harris, Dame Siona Reid and Talat Yakub. Writer, director and spoken by Hannah Lavery. Performer and movement director Natalie McCleary. Composer Beldina Odenio. Filmmaker Beth Chalmers. Stage manager Babette Wickham Riddick. Sound advisor Richard Price. Audio Describer, Christopher McKiddy. Further Credits Roll. Welcome to this panel event discussing 13 Fragments, this beautiful, eloquent and thoughtful piece of work written and directed by Hannah Lavery about women's experience during the pandemic. The film is a co-production between the National Theatre of Scotland and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, commissioned to reflect some aspects of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's post-COVID futures commission. My name is Zinni Harris and I'm a theatre director and a playwright. With me, I have two wonderful and interesting women that I hope will join in a conversation about this short film. Firstly, Hannah Lavery herself, the writer and director of the piece of work that you've just watched. Hannah is a poet, playwright, performer and director. She's one of Imaginate's accelerator artists and an associate artist with the National Theatre of Scotland, as well as writer in residence at the Lyceum Youth Theatre. In November 2020, her highly acclaimed play, Lament for Shaker Bio, was produced by the Royal Lyceum Theatre, National Theatre of Scotland and the Edinburgh International Festival in a production that Hannah directed. And that piece of work, Lament, is back on at the International Festival this year. 
Her poetry has been published widely and her poem, Scotland, You're No Mine, was selected by Roseanne Watt as one of the best Scottish po poems in 2019. Her pamphlet, Finding Sea Glass, was published by Stewed Rhubarb Press in 2019 and her debut poetry collection, Blood Salt Spring, will be published by Polygon in 2022. Talat Yakub is an independent consultant, campaigner and fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Her work focuses on tackling inequalities, primarily on gender and race equality. She's the co-founder of Women 5050, which aims to increase women's representation in politics and the founder of Pass the Mic, the first and only directory of women of colour experts to amplify their voices and expertise in Scotland. Hopefully in this next um, 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to talk a lot of the, about a lot of the themes that came out of that piece of work. But I just wanted to kick off by saying um, what struck me about the work was that it feels both utterly contemporary, and I'm thinking of the references to iPad goodbyes and homeschooling, but it also weaves references from across the ages, making it feel mythic and classical. We hear, Troj we hear and get images of Trojan women, Cassandra, a grandmother handing us rosemary, all the time while we're placing our experience in the context uh, we're, we're placing our experience in about this last year in the context of past generations it also for me kind of conjured up something of the connectedness that we have had um, as we not only live through the pandemic but experience the shared trauma of things like the Sarah Everard and the Black Lives Matter but also that we've lived this time in in utter isolation so I just thought I'd kind of kick off really asking you Hannah to tell us a little bit about your your hopes and and aims as you started this this piece of work I think for me, I was really interested when um, I had like my first conversations with the Royal Society of Edinburgh about this idea of a resilient, like how we kind of move forward into the future. And I was uh, really informed by uh, Lynn, Professor Lynn Abrams, uh, caring about inequality at home and Talat's work on discussions, kind of the importance of discussions with communities. And was really, so I suppose I kind of started off with looking at the silences, I think, and something about who the experiences that are that we we need to recognise and to value as we move forward, and how that would inform um, the kind of future that we want. But there seemed to be a, a I suppose it seemed to be that last year all felt like a reckoning, um, and that I wanted a sort of. Um, reflect that but also to um and I think the reason why it's fragmentary is it felt also that we were we were responding to it as women as Scottish women as women of color and with all our different parts of ourselves and I felt that it was in you know as a mother as well it felt like there were so many pulls and pushes and 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 moments of 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 um it, that things felt like we were the tension it felt like a breaking down and a rebuilding and a breaking down again and and so this idea of what our future would be for me I wanted to create a piece that felt a bit like a provocation that was a bit kind of like what is it what is the future what is it that we want and I think I was struck especially around the conversations that happened around Sarah Everard around the conversations that were happening around um, Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Sammons at the beginning of um, this year and the end of last year was these ideas about what is what what society do we want to emerge on and what it is about safety and how do we flourish and how do we get past the idea of just surviving or this idea of resilience is something this feeling that we want more than just to cope that we deserve more than just coping and we deserve to look into our future and we deserve to to say to our ch to our children and to our daughters that actually the, 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 you can climb the tree, you can go as high as you want, that you can have ambition um, and that we come, that we move forward, but we move forward with our wounds, we move forward with our grandmother's memories and we hold all of that. So I think I was trying to do all of that and, and I was really struck by these conversations that were beginning within the commissions and the, and the, the link, you know, the kind of work that I was sent that was really about that, these discussions that need to, to happen and about the burden that women are carrying. 
there's something so right about it being a, a, a kind of provocation. And I think that's what's so clever about the fact that it's fragments. It's not it's not sort of stating what comes next. It's kind of saying this was the collective experience and, and you give us that beautiful image of the rose as something that's planted, but we don't know what will what will go on, what will bloom, you know, that, that sense of naming it as hers. Talat, this is very much the the, the area that you're, you're in, isn't it? This is a, a sort of artistic response to a lot of the things that you're spending your working life kind of thinking about. What was your response to the piece? Well, firstly, it is beautiful. Like I, I watched it and it's beautiful to watch. I then replayed it and just listened to the words and it's, it's both beautiful to watch and listen to and all together um, a really impressive, thoughtful piece of work. And it, it made me realize how rare it is for something that is so policy focused, which is what the commission has been doing. It's very much about policy and how rare it is, too rare, for there to be a way to think about it, a way to interact with it that brings in the arts. And that that is all too rare. And this is a really good example of why that is a collaboration that needs to happen more often. Because it made me think about the work that I'm doing with a renewed uh, sense of hope. It made me think about it in different ways. And when we were talking about the fragments, everything, Hannah, you've just outlined there are the struggles with which we have come to the Commission and tried to piece these things together. Because, of course, you know, the fragments that Hannah so, so um, articulately ex expressed there and then does so through her spoken word and her poetry in the 13 fragments, those fragments exist when we're trying to create better and improved society. And often, that fragmentation, the siloed thinking, thinking that something exists over here, but it doesn't exist over here, is why our policy making is not fit for purpose. So having a kind of um, such a creative and artistic overview of what the Commission has been struggling with and, and researching and understanding and talking to people about was really refreshing, but done in such a vivid way that I think our it just articulated some of the policy frustrations in a new and better way and it really made me think about how can I do more of that in the rest of my work and how do we do more of that in policy making in conversation building and research how do we build in more creativity more artistic approaches to enable us to think about this and talk about this in a different way I really enjoyed it is it worth th saying, I think, just before, because we'll talk more, just to, uh, to give us a, just an overview of what the Commission is and what it's doing, just for those that don't understand or haven't come across it? So the Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission um, was put together by the Royal Society of Edinburgh last year. When we were in the midst of the pandemic, thinking about, well, what do we want to, what do we want to learn from this? How do we want to come out? And it was about building a feeder society as a consequence of that and um, a whole host of um, experts from different areas and um, from uh, public participation from the arts from um, public services and health economy business scientists from all different areas um, were asked to come together and then working groups of wider um, networks were put together and we talk about public debate and participation and um, building inclusive public services and um, access to science um, and uh, building national resilience. All of these different different areas and working groups that we, we have created to be able to try and put together recommendations, key learnings, ideas and thoughts to encourage an improved Scotland, a fairer Scotland coming out of COVID-19. And having an opportunity to work with Hannah and having Hannah's input on this in the fantastic film that's been produced puts, to, puts into context, artistic context, wider context, the conversations we're having inside the Commission. We're asking ourselves questions such as who gets to have access to decision making? We're asking ourselves questions such as um, do our public services work for those who need them the most? how do we create trust in science and expertise in a time when conspiracy and fake news 
is, is growing and is more of a concern. Big questions require a lot of reflection and often contradictions coming at us through the Commission. So it's a lot of big thinking. Um, and the hope is to produce a report. Um, uh, we've done a number of events, uh, um, public events, and hopefully there will be more to come uh, in the next parliamentary session where we outline some of our thinking in the hope of building that better Scotland everyone deserves. And so it's sort of when you're talking about what it is that art can bring, is it is what, you know, what, what are we kind of getting at here? Is it that space where we can feel something kind of emotionally, we feel it in a different way? I mean, Hannah, uh, uh, this is to you too, you know, in a way what you're what you're trying to do with the commission is, is take the kind of lots of different people's kind of collective experience in order to take it forward. And Hannah, there you're working with very personal material close to you, I suspect, or that's, that's your starting point is always the individual. I don't know whether either of you have a kind of thought. Um, I mean, I think for me, I suppose as an artist, it's, it, it, as a poet especially, it's about, I, it's about looking very closely. So it's kind of getting back to the sort of taking, what was quite as interesting for me, it was it, a lot of these conversations were happening, were, were kind of taking little things and making, and making, um, you know, take, taking these individual moments and interactions and trying to build that into thinking about how that could be put into policy or to put into decision making that would affect a wider society and I suppose to, to affect us all and, and, and then I think my job is almost to, to turn that back around again is to go how are these big things how do they then relate back into a smaller and to bring that sort of individual um, and to bring that kind of individual response and that personal response and so it's certainly it was, I mean, the eye, I mean, it's always difficult, isn't it? The eye in a piece of work, and especially in poetry, because in a sense it is me, but then it isn't also not me. Um, but it definitely came out of many, going almost going back to, into my own circle and starting some of those conversations that were happening. Um, and, and then I think the piece, when I brought those words into the room with Beth and Baldina and Nat, it was almost then about kind of, again, bringing in their personal reactions and their, which is what happened with the music and the film, the filmmaking and, and the and the movement. It was all sort of we were having we were constantly having a conversation about what this year meant to us and what that meant to us from where we stood and where we came from and how we responded to um, this year. And I think that for me, I always feel that I suppose what what art can do, and what poet can, poetry can do. And I, and Roger Robinson talks really eloquently about this is about it creates empathy. It kind of it draws people in and it's about, and I think I think very much this is a beginning of a conversation, this piece to me, it felt like this is, um, would hopefully support conversation because I, my hope was it would, it would, um, it would offer an opportunity for people to build their empathy for each other. And I feel like that when we're talking about creating fairer and better societies, then it feels to me that the root of that or the, what supports that is, is developing our empathy for each other. Yes, absolutely. And, and also sort of giving space. I mean, I sort of feel that the, the other kind of achievement of the piece is that it, it allows a kind of contemplation, a kind of almost, it's, it's almost meditative you know the way that you you read it and it allows you to sort of you're drawn into to an experience that, that that allows kind of thought rather than you know quite often when we're thinking about how we're going to make things better or how it, it there's quite a lot of sort of facts coming at us and I mean I don't know maybe Talat you can speak to that better but it, it, it allowed me to kind of stop and 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 take some space you know in the policy landscape we we use the term lived experience a lot. And uh, sometimes we use it accurately. A lot of the times we don't. Right? And um, what this piece illustrates is to me, <laughs> so that's the thing about it is, is a personal reflection, I guess, to me is exactly what Hannah said, bringing it back to those who are living it day in, day out, bringing it back to those experiences because decision making and policy making in Scotland, we, we do talk a lot about being progressive, we do talk and there are very good things about it, but we're not there yet. We're nowhere near there yet. We're pretty heavy on the rhetoric at times of it. So policy making, decision making is still quite really very exclusionary. 
it's a small group of people and sometimes that includes me talking about things and then those things happening to people it's not happening with people and whilst watching this multiple times now <laughs> today um again thinking about the fact that none of that matters if those stories those experiences the granular level of how does how has covid felt how has inequality felt what impact has that had on your life on your livelihood on your family on your relationships on your health if those two things are not linked together policy making and decisions will never be fit for purpose so that's why those two sides matter the decision making can't happen over here with the experience of life happening somewhere else and i think that's what this brings us back to the, the words bring us back to how people have felt what that experience has been hannah talking about her own experiences and talking to others in her network and then building this um wonderful production i think more of that needs to happen and more of that and the policy realm needs to come together so that the data and the science doesn't feel so far away. The numbers that we've talked about, when we talk about numbers of people who have died from COVID-19, when we talk about the number of people who have, contra who have um, contracted COVID-19, they're not numbers, they're people. They're families that are affected. They are friends that are grieving. They are communities that are harmed. And in the case of COVID-19, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities, women, disabled people, working class communities, disproportionately affected. They aren't just numbers. There's these are people's lives. And I think we need to bring that back into focus more because as COVID-19 has progressed, I think we have started to normalize some of the harm of it. And um, we've become used to some of the, 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 the bad news of it, but we have to go back to remembering it's people it's communities, it's us and our next door neighbours and our mothers and our fathers and our families. Um, and I think this piece of work does that very well. And I think we need to do more of that um, across decision making. Something so eloquent about, you know, we, we talk to our children about, I'm not, I'm going to misquote probably, but talk to our children about death as we share our laptops and, you know, that that kind of sense of, of, of you know, having to do the day to day and the homeschooling and all that kind of stuff and having to grapple with these kind of huge, huge, um, difficult things that were happening. But I think that the piece is, is broader than just COVID-19 in a way, because it's talking about this year, you know, she, she, she starts, sorry, Hannah, you start with, you know, that year, this year, and, and the kind of emotional experience that we've been through as women you know um has been so affected by the fact that actually we were all safe oddly we didn't have we didn't have to go out at night we didn't you know there was something about being in our houses and then having this kind of horrific you know I mean I know it it happens all the time and, and Sarah Everard sort of hit a level of publicity that, that isn't afforded a, a lot of, of murders and, and we have to be mindful of that but there was this kind of moment of kind of collective what the hell is this how can we be safe and then you know many times we and now we're having to sort of re-navigate coming out in the world and how are we going to take that space and and was that was how did that sort of uh, emerge Hannah or was that just so much part of your kind of emotional landscape of the year that it was bound to be there in a reflection well I mean I mean I think for, yeah there, I mean I, I there was I'd had this I was doing a series of workshops and a young woman said to me we were talking about zoom and we were talking about how you know that that normal conversation about how awful it is we miss seeing people in real life and blah blah and she just sort of piped up and she said, actually, I found it really liberating because I'm in control of what people see and I'm in control and I'm frightened about when everything opens up that I'll no longer be in control of how people perceive me or about being out in the world. And I think that was very much running through my head. And then when I started to look about that in, you know, when I started to read the work about how women are very, like we've been kind of, we've been thrown back in our homes and there's a lot of talk about how we've kind of gone that we've been taking the, the the lion's share of the kind of domestic responsibilities and all of this and so there seemed to be this this interesting thing about what home is or creating our homes and then of course we had you know the thing with Sarah Everett but we also had a lot of stuff around 
the kind of like really sort of conversations about the world that we want and the world that we want to inhabit. And, and I think for me that that felt um, really something that I wanted to talk about. And I felt that there was a, there is, um, you will be talk about resilience and we talk about it. It seems to be so much about resilience to me often seems it's like a flight or fight response. And it feels like we spent, and I think a lot of people kind of reassess their lives and went, actually, I don't want to live my life on that level of stress. I don't want to just survive. I want to have more and I want to be in control more. And, and when we started to talk about this in the room, this is when the film came about this idea about Nat's body as a landscape, but also that we were controlling the gaze. And then the point in the film where we lose the control when it when we start talking about, when we have the jump cuts, which we felt, you know, that was about the way a body is there, you know, like where a female body is, 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 is without our control, the way it is seen and the way it's perceived. And then, but actually having the control of where we point the camera and where we want to be seen. And, and I think that was trying to talk to that idea about actually the world we want or out of this year is one that we have more control of, the, way, the world that, that feels safe for us and whether that is as, as you know, someone of color or whether that is someone um, in terms of, you know, of, of being a woman and being, in, and being free of, of um, uh, you know, all the different burdens that we have to carry, then that, 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 yeah, that was a real starting point for me. And when actually when I got the commission, it was literally just off the back of, of the time of when I was given it, it was just on the back of what was happening with Sarah Everest. So that was very much in the news as well. So I think that all kind of um, informed it. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, so many things we, we were kind of up against it, uh, ourselves as women. I mean, a lot of us were, were taken into a much more kind of heavy, caring role of, of kind of either elderly relatives or of young children or, you know, I mean, even teenagers required so much more than, than sort of previously. Uh, so it's sort of set against this backdrop and, and tell like you'll probably be able to speak to this much more, but of, of a kind of sense that actually a lot of the ground that we'd gained in terms of kind of our own time and, and being able to put our, put our own work first somehow sort of slid slid away and and there was a kind of you know I think personally we or a lot of us kind of felt that we'd gone back to a kind of real grind of the of there was nothing but the domestic and I don't know if there's if you know COVID-19 for me has illustrated how the equality or the progress that we thought we'd gained is actually really quite superficial mm -hmm. and that it didn't it, it didn't take much for those for the the ground to shift again so how quickly women took on disproportionate levels even even higher disproportionate levels of care women were more likely to lose um income and the number of hours that they're working um it was a black Asian minority ethnic communities more likely to um get covid and die as a consequence of covid um, equally higher proportion of them likely to lose income, but more likely to be frontline staff um, putting their own lives at risk and staying, saving the lives of others. We know this and COVID-19 has exacerbated those, um, those inequalities, but there are certain things like the language that we use suddenly be people became vulnerable. We we're using the term vulnerable a lot more, thought we had moved on from that how quickly when we're talking about um, the current, the shape of, of policy making right now, which is about getting back out and opening up and, and really particularly UK government um, decisions about learning to live with COVID, but not really thinking through what kind of impact does that have for those who are most at risk, unpaid carers um, and frontline staff. And across the board, the majority of those are, are women and within that disproportionate numbers of women of colour. So. I think it, it has illustrated to more people than just those of us who work with inequalities how slow the progress has been and how fast we've we've retreated back into a, a very unequal space and some of the wins that we had achieved even those we're going to need to fight for again so there's just there's 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 a lot um of there's a lot within the experience of COVID-19, which has highlighted which those of us who experienced inequality regularly is highlighted that further. And I hope has highlighted it to those who experience less of that inequality. Um, we've certainly had a lot of that talk. Now we need to convert that into 
kind of change and 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 learning. Um, I think there's a there's a line, and again, I'm 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 going to do the same things, and which is I'm going to remember the line and then not do it justice. And I'm very sorry about that. But there's a line where you said, um, "As if we all had a choice, as if we all had our say." I think it is, and that's exactly it. With choices and the level of stake and the level of um, space you occupy within the conversations that are taking place and decisions are being made is already decided by the your protected characteristics, your class, you know, your experience, your education level, the personal networks you have. So we didn't all have multi multiple choices. We didn't all have a say. And that is what um, defined our experience over the last 15, 16 months. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely wanted to speak to that. And that, that line is also about, you know, there seemed to also be a lot of last year where there was a lot of people that wanted to know supposedly about, about our lives and that, you know, that our lives were mattered and it was, let's, you know, and so there was a kind of call to share experience, but then, but, but there was such a vulnerability in that of not knowing where that led to and what that meant. And so there was, I felt there was a, it was a year of a lot of promises and then it was, you've had your say, and then realizing actually, you don't, you know, that we haven't finished speaking and that actually these were, that we haven't, we were not, that power of not being able to create your own world. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I did, I definitely feels that. And I think because we're, we're so divided, you know, our society feels so divided. And, and I think a lot of us were experiencing each other through social media last year, perhaps, you know, it felt like a lot of people were speaking for, for people. And it, you know, and you were, and, and it, our conversations were beginning and ending before you'd even had a chance to, or before the people who needed to speak had spoken, if that makes any sense. So I think I wanted to sort of, I definitely want to reflect that in the piece. And I definitely feel that really strongly that a lot of conversations were started last year, or a lot of promises of discussion or conversations um, were made. But I, but I worry that as we come out of it, that there will be, they will, they will not they will they will stop or they will they will they'll, the energy to have them will stop and I think that's a real concern concern of mine I think because I think you're right I think we're at this really kind of we're at this point where we could pop you know that we could have a proper reckoning that we could really say these are the things that we've learned as communities as individuals as families this is a moment for us to say what what do we want and 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 what's acceptable and and that we just need to keep the energy and the fire going because your worry is that as things open up that that we'll be kind of sucked back into those busy overwhelming exhausting lives and that all of this beginnings stuff will not kind of go to the next step and what's your sense on that talak because i think we hope is a sort of thing that we all had our own experience of last year i mean you know at every point there was you know right at the beginning there was kind of people saying online oh but this is great this is how the you know climate change is going to be held in its tracks and the airplanes aren't in and then you know as we kind of got into it that didn't really kind of turn out to be the case and then you know there is now this sort of highlight on how unequal society was it was highlighted before but it but has come to the sort of national debate in a in a slightly more high profile way and do, do you do, what is your sort of sense of how that will be taken forward or, or do you think it, as she sort of as it says in the piece you know the time capsule will it be buried or will that will that rose bloom so i i want to be an optimist um <laughs> But it's not my natural disposition. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, um, and and I also acknowledge the fact that the piece ends hopefully. The the piece ends in in, in hope, and I, I and that's where, you know, we're talking about um the rose, and we're talking about um uh, climbing that tree, and 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 it's it's the ending of it is beautiful, and I do think that there's hope there. The concern I guess I have with this, and it just it links exactly to what Hannah was saying there. At the beginning of this, there was a lot of conversation. We kept hearing build back better or build forward better. What my concern is, is that we're talking a lot about, so now over the last few weeks, we've been talking about uh, opening up uh, changes, um, 
ex essentially no restrictions in, in, in England, um, very few restrictions within Scotland, so although we're keeping face masks, which I agree with. What I am, what we've witnessed is um, actually a return back to normal, but normal wasn't working for the majority of people. So there was a conversation that was optimistic, I would say, in the first six months. We were really talking about, you know, this is this is a point where we should be thinking about how we build a better society. There was a lot of conversation about four day working weeks, conversations about flexible working becoming the norm. Um, how do people who have always been isolated because you know, thinking about the fact that we, some people were having to stay at home or stay very local. Well, for a lot of disabled people and unpaid carers, that was every day. That was normal life. We were experiencing a little piece of what their everyday life was. Actually, you know, 15 months on and how we are opening up makes me think we're actually forgetting those lessons of the first six months. And part of that is um, frustration, exhaustion, and a lack of empathy. And I think we need to get, get back into that first six month thinking, which was, we've got to get through this together. And if we're gonna get through it together, that means we've all got to be given what's needed to get through it together. Some of us need more than others because some of us are further back in the queue because of historic institutionalized inequality. So how are we going to do that building back where everyone gets to start from the same place or is at the very least given what's needed to end up in the same place? Yeah. That conversation is um, still frustratingly far behind. And, and I think also the sort of very human thing of when an era is over, and of course we're not we're not really quite to the end of it yet, but that sort of feeling of well, you know, that's it done now. We'll we'll just move on. But actually, something about as you said, those early conversations, we need to sort of remember the things that we were learning, and 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 you know, it might be all too tempting just to kind of put it all in a cupboard and go, well, that that was the time that was sort of thing. Hannah, any thoughts from you about that? Yeah, no, I'm I'm in total agreement, and I and and share a lot of that. And I think that, I think for me, it's also just that whole thing about there was a point where we realised that we had agency, mm -hmm. and and it feels that there's so there's so much now that now is kind of taking that away from us again. That we actually realised that as communities we could look after our neighbours if we wanted to. That we could. There was something in that that was I found really kind of um, the revolutionary in a sense that actually you know you just give us what we need and we will make you know we will knock on our neighbors doors and we will we will make sure people are okay and you know when you had small villages and, and small towns and and big towns and everything has got people going out for like Black Lives Matter and they were just they were just saying right that's it we're just going to go and stand on our village green and we're just going to do this and it just there was such, I mean, obviously there was a lot of, you know, we can talk about the kind of naivety of that or whatever, but, or the performativeness of that, but but they just felt like, oh, actually as communities, we can change things. We don't need permission. We don't need to wait. We can just do it ourselves. And, and and you know, I'm not even sure really where I'm going with that, but it feels like that was that was really hopeful. That felt like that, that we could, that we could kind of make these really, and they were capable, actually. I think that's what it was. We're really capable of changing quickly and responding and we didn't and now it feels I suppose and it does feel in a sense that some of that's been kind of um you know there's so many barriers that have been put up about that where actually there was a moment where we just went actually I can just help my neighbor or I can say enough's enough I can I can as an individual or I can as a community or I can and I and I um and it did feel really hopeful and it was I, sort of reaching I, out, wasn't it? A sort of reaching out to people that you wouldn't necessarily kind of have known, and and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, there's the music about it, I think. And I think there's also an exhaustion. Mm. I people, you know, um, I think there's an exhaustion in the number of barriers that exist, um, and I think people want to see at least some change people want to be able to see that their voice has made some kind of difference because that is what gives you the hope the enthusiasm the passion to do more and so when you and, and yes it's you call it naivety or 
um, but they, they wanted to see some good happen because that's what that's what spurs you to keep going and i think there, there certainly feels like an exhaustion um and also and i feel this as somebody who's <laughs> campaigned on equalities issues for a long time there's so many things to fight mm. right there's so many different aspects to fight and COVID 19 has highlighted all of that but they existed all along mm. that i think for for many people who want to engage in that knowing where to start and you know hannah your your piece um really highlights the contradictions there's a bit that i was um really um struck by is we clung to our borders we, we clung to our borders um hoping for escape but just not for them again i've not done that justice i'm very sorry um but but that th those contradictions the, the the way in which it's it's the, this group of people get something that this group of people we've decided has does not and these are arbitrary nonsense um categories we've created which is really just to ensure that those who have power keep it and those who don't have power don't get any and that frustration that exhaustion for people who have been fighting equalities and in fighting inequalities fighting for justice COVID-19 is even more exhausting because there's even more to be done so I think there's there's hope within that because more people I think are are awake and 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 are aware of this but I think there's so many barriers in being able to do something about it that we need to really try and tackle and 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 I don't know if the, if you have any sort of solution to that, but I mean, you know, Hannah's able to make this wonderfully sort of provocative piece to really kind of keep that that dialogue going or or to 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 re provoke. And and you obviously are involved in policy, but for sort of the person that that isn't plugged into either of those things, it is difficult to know how to you know, particularly as you say, when when a lot of us just want to move on with our lives and get on with the next thing or back in that busy world how do we keep that conversation going how do we sort of tackle those things yeah. i mean it definitely feels to me that like we've lived through a global pandemic and we've got a global issue around climate change and so so many it, it always just and i think i put that's why i had that line call it scotland it was like it's not the none of the solutions though i feel that actually bringing power closer to people is always a good thing but actually all of these conversations feel to me like they're global conversations and and i think that we need to kind of see this pandemic as being you know it's it is beyond our borders and it's beyond and we can and we can be even just for our own self interest we need to look beyond our own sort of um um yeah we need to look beyond and see how that we that the solutions are global solutions and these conversations are global conversations and and i think that you know it's it's good to talk about a positive future for scotland but i think that that positive future for scotland really can only be fully realized when it's a positive future for all of us wherever we live and i think that that felt really a really i really wanted to make that kind of point in the piece but that also feels to me that that was one of the opportunities that we had with this pandemic was to start to realize that the solutions to many of our problems um are solutions that we have to find together as a as a as a world and not keep kind of dreaming of our own um kind of nation i mean that whole idea of you know it just seems bizarre to me that we're living in a point where we're still obsessed by nationhood because it, it's um it feels obscene really and you sort of you reach a, a sort of globally but also kind of consciously in the piece you, you reach back in time on a number of, of kind of occasions we hear sort of cassandra we, we're kind of given the image of the the trojan women and, and and i wondered how that sort of fitted into your experience of of uh you know a woman living through this year that's my thought to you hannah and, and also tell what whether there there is a role for that in policy of kind of thinking you know not just just out at, at the contemporary but also the, the the sort of how have we dealt with moments like this in the past really how how do we connect to our own past well, i think i mean i think that and i actually think that um pa pat barker talked about this really beautifully about actually in times of kind of peril or in times of um trauma we often go back to the greek mythology because it gives us such a kind of 
um, uh, kind of blueprint of humanity. And I think so there's probably some of that, but particularly the idea of Cassandra, who has this sort of grasp of what the future is, but is ignored. And there was something for me, I think, about the kind of silenced or ignored women who are often the canaries in the mine. We're often, no, we can often feel the tremors of what's happening. And and um, and not having that, that that those voices at the table, and I think there was some of that. And then I think there was also we, this year. I think especially, you know, it has been a reckoning. And I think as you know, as somebody who has who has a family history that's very much kind of um, tied and brutalized by kind of colonialism. You know, it's it's it was very you you know your grandmothers did appear this year for me. Like I did feel very accompanied by my ancestors this year and there was a lot of voices from that and there was a lot of looking at my own history and looking at my place and and looking at what you know this country is sort of history and the moment and what that brought and so there was I think there was a lot of those conversations happening and it felt that like you couldn't talk about this year and the future without saying actually this has been really um, important that we actually talk about why we are, where our wealth comes from, where all of, because we have the ability to be a progressive society, but the reason why we have the ability is that much that we have this wealth and, you know, behind every, what do they say, behind every um, great wealth is a great crime. And I think that this has been a year of reckoning. So it, it felt to the absolute sense that my grandmothers are appearing. And I think when you talk about, you know, and also I think as a mother, when you talk about your children, you also, it feels to me it's such a you you feel that line don't you you feel that kind of what you're what you carry and the, and what you put forward and so I think all of that was going on but yeah I definitely feel that um you know yeah it does feel like it's we're returning back to those old stories because we need we need those um those lessons and those blueprints I think tell that how about you yeah, I think in some ways, in some ways, it's, it's the blueprint. It's about learning what has happened before, what what we can do, what what worked well. It's also learning from history and some things, knowing not not to let some things happen again, because in some ways we we are doing that. We're becoming very insular. We're bec we're thinking about the people who are only need us, as opposed to, and and our response to COVID our response to climate change, our response to racism or sexism, it's not happening within our borders. <laughs> These are big issues that are happening everywhere and we don't get to close ourselves off yeah. because it, it, it doesn't actually stop any danger, it doesn't stop anything from happening and it certainly doesn't lend itself to progress because that's not the direction progress is going in. The progress is of more people coming together, it's about global solutions to global problems. So I, I absolutely hear that and I think one of the ways that is has um, articulated itself is during COVID-19 is who we are choosing to learn from and which nations we compare ourselves to. So if you look at, um, you know, we've, we spent a lot of time talking about New Zealand and um, New Zealand has done very well. And but but we could also have learned from um, South East Asian countries, we could have also learned from um, East African countries who have actually dealt with this ex exceptionally well um, and are dealing with it better, dare I say, than what we are certainly um, UK wide at the moment. So who we choose to learn from, who we see as equals to us as we partner with them, learn from them, um, develop through COVID-19 how vaccines are shared, how the solutions are shared, who with, who gets a stake in recovery, are all lessons that need to be learned from the inequality that's happened before and historically. And if you look at where we choose to learn and where vaccines are distributed, who owns copyrights, you will see the footprints of colonialism and all of that. And so it's it's vital that we learn where we've come from, how we've got to where we are today, both to learn the good, but also make sure we don't repeat the mistakes. And I don't, and I think there has been a lot of call for that very much through the Black Lives Matters movement. But um, we, we did a lot of, you know, shared statements and support last summer when there was uh, a resurgence of protests, but that didn't start and end in summer. It, it requires us to put in the effort throughout every day and all of the solutions and decisions that we're making, solutions we're thinking about, the research that we're doing. And um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh did a, uh, an international 
round table to learn from it. And we had there um, people, uh, experts from Taiwan, from Brazil, from Argentina, from um, uh, Ghana, from South Africa. And what was interesting was despite working in this area, despite reading lots of things about COVID-19 at the moment as part of the commission, in other places, we were not hearing from that diverse global audience, global expertise. And I'm really glad that the Royal Society of Edinburgh have done that and that report will be published soon. But that shouldn't, that shouldn't be a one-off. That should be a normal part of the conversations that we have to create global solutions to global problems. And I think we're probably starting to, to run out of time now. Just the other thing that, that is just so beautifully sort of touched on in the piece is, I think it's in part two, is that idea of friendship, which in a way is sort of chiming with what you're saying, you, you know, reaching across, understanding empathetically what other people are experiencing, but also our friends very kind of close on the ground and, and, and how important they've been to us. And I, I don't know, Hannah, if you want to say anything about about your experience of friendship with other women and 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 that kind of community of women which you're you're so talking about in this piece i mean i think i think it's been my female friends that have got me through this it's been those little walks or we've and actually those little moments if there's you know the bits that are really for my real life are the ones where like sitting on a bench with like my best friends and drinking a gin and tonic out of our kids water bottles and just being able to talk and but and i think what really struck me actually is so much and especially i think um so much of female friendship is betrayed in a way that doesn't ever feel real, real to me. I think women, when we come together, we talk about the big issues. We have those state of the nation conversations. We, we, we also have conversations which are really based on listening and really hearing each other, I think. I mean, not all women, who wants to make a generalization, but th there was something I felt about last year about those, those, and I was seeing it a lot where we were having these wonderful, moments in nature together that we were escaping together into and there was also I live beside the sea and and I was just struck about how more and more women over the course of the year were taken to the sea like all the through just every you know every, start off and say one or two and then by now it means like almost every including myself now everybody is hitting the sea to swim and we're all and there seems to be a thing about wanting to be strong and I think I was and I think for me you know and, and I talked a lot about Nat to Nat about this when we were making the film, there was something about that, looking at our bodies differently, looking at our health differently, looking at who we were and that gaze and being free perhaps of the gaze for a while to be able to say actually what we want is strength and we want power. And actually we took to the sea and we swam together and we laughed together and we sat on benches and we shared so much that I think the normal life didn't allow us that, even though that we were drowning in domestic stuff that when we got to be together in those little moments of walks or being that there was something really special in that and I do think that there's a power in the way women communicate with each other and I think it'd be I think there's a lot of people that could learn from the way women, where, where female friends communicate with each other because it's 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 often very rooted in in empathy and it's very rooted in in um hearing each other and being vulnerable with each other and I think that you know I I I think that we would we would progress and we would we'd have a much more um, fairer society if we were allowed vulnerability in those conversations and allowed people to to um, to be wrong because actually a lot of this year is about being a lot of people are being confronted with with realities that and, and of people's lives that they didn't didn't ever know. And there's been a lot of a lot of people going. I didn't know that, and I didn't understand that, and now I, and I want to, and um, and so there's, and I think there's, yeah. So I think that's why they're there, those women, um, in the piece. Uh, what about you, tell that and friendship? Did that? Oh, my multiple times in my life, it is my friends, my sisterhood that has saved me. Um, and COVID nineteen is no exception. I've had just those. I've not. I've not been uh, brave enough to dip myself in the sea. I've got to be honest, right? And I have been, I've been recommended it multiple times. And over the last year, more and more women have been recommending it to me. So I might have to do it, but I just don't know if I'm there yet. But um, yeah, the same thing, having those walks, having that empathy, having that place to, um, to genuinely be all the different bits of yourself. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've really felt during COVID um, is I, I would I would have once upon a time kept my lives quite separate. Here I am at work. Now I'm going home and I've got to do those things. Well, I can't do that. You're in my home right now. 
<laughs> appearance are in the background. And <laughs> And so, you know, um, I think in some ways it has given me and I've had these conversations with lots of the women in my life. It has given us, um, well, it's, it's meant that we've had to be all the bits of ourselves at the same time because everything is happening in the same space. But it's also in some ways, and lots of the women in my life have talked about this, it has allowed us to maybe... Um, unpick some of the superficiality that was around us that we were having to perform to other other expectations other people's expectations patriarchal ex patriarchal expectations whatever that might be some of them we've been able to drop because of exactly as what hannah said at the beginning of this you know, there's a little bit of control of of what's being seen i don't have to perform in the same way i'm not going out in the same way and so in in some strange ways we've had conversations about feelings of relief yeah um at ha being able to opt out of conventions that were harming us yeah, yeah. and those are conversations that I've certainly had yeah. um within the wider sisterhood that I am very privileged to be part of yeah me too I mean my my experience of lockdown was was um that my sister who's who's also a single mum moved in with her uh, small child right at the start so we, we we you know we were two women and four kids and absolutely did it as this sort of kinship group and and really we're kind of talking quite a lot about how different it felt to, to you know we had we we have male children but we, we we had no sort of men around and and in some ways you're right about the the, the, the sort of losing the sort of any sense of performative or or you know having to adopt ways that that, that maybe aren't kind of as instinctive but um i am going to wrap this up because i think we're coming up against time and just firstly to thank you both for for wonderful kind of input hannah what an amazing piece of work i think you've really you've really um done something absolutely extraordinary and i'm sure um the the audience will have will have enjoyed watching it personally i had to i i wanted to to watch it again as soon, i don't know if that's possible with 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 how they're accessing it but but i felt that that, that um, kind of going through it, I, I actually watched it three times because I just felt that there was so much in your imagery that I really wanted to, to sort of ingest really. But I just thought we'd, we'd finished by just taking maybe one moment each that we that really resonated with us that, that we'll kind of hang on to of the kind of plethora of, of rich imagery that, that Hannah gave us. Tala, I don't know if you want to start with that one. Gosh, there's, Hannah, there's a lot in it. I don't, um... I think one of the things that I I um, really did pick up on was I think you talked about there was something about Grenfell Tower in there there was a, there was a George Floyd Black Lives Matter Sarah Everard and I think what really captured what really captured my attention was whilst everything has been happening inequality has continued to flourish in other ways and the reality check of bringing all of that together. In, in in this in this piece was really powerful um and i think it, it created a sense of, of duty a sense of urgency and also highlighted some of the contradictions of what we are talking about on our front pages and what isn't talked about and what is on the front forefront of our minds and what isn't and um i think that was exceptionally well done and a very important reminder wonderful thank you and Hannah, I mean, obviously, you, you made it, all the images are yours, but but is there one that particularly kind of you hang on to? I think one of the powerful bits for me was I'd written a piece about statues and about, you know, if if we built a statue for our sisters and and Beldina, eh, not Beldina, Nat responded to that so beautifully with the, when we kind of, the camera came up, Beth, Beth had kind of scoped the camera up and then when it gets to, to Nat's face, she just turns away in this most beautiful um, image of sort of strength and power and, and, and defiance. And I think whenever I think of that film, I just, I, I see Nat's face just kind of holding all of that um, history and wisdom and, and yeah, and I, I definitely feel that, that, that there should be statues to our sisters and buildings built for our sisters for our sisters to speak and I think that was probably that felt felt that that's what we were doing together and as a group of women making this film is that we were creating our own our own space for women to speak in and I hopefully what's been lovely about this today is it felt like like that it, that kind of provocation or that kind of space we created is, is worked on some way so 
And, and I'm also so glad that you've brought in the, you know, the beautiful performance and filmmaking, because we've, we've been sort of talking about the kind of themes and, and, and haven't really sort of mentioned that, but, but, but absolutely stunning imagery and, and, and music and the whole thing. But um, OK, well, my, mine, I think, as you know, is just I love the, the kind of metaphor that you give us of, of the rose at the beginning and, and, and what will happen to it. And, and then at the end, your, your beautiful line about what to call it and I'll, I'll call it hers, I think is just just absolutely something that I'll hold really really tight as we all think about what comes from this you know will it be ours that, that will it will it be belong to her us uh, as we go forward so thank you both so much um absolutely terrific um, i've really enjoyed this and i hope you have too